Awesome, 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 awesome. My name is Jason, guys. Welcome to the Brand Identity Design Podcast. This is a business podcast. My rooms are hosted on LinkedIn as well as on Clubhouse every Wednesday at 12 Eastern Standard Time. The goal of this show is to educate more entrepreneurs about the business side of things, hardship, adversities, how to deal with it. And today, I've been joined uh, by Michelle Kopp. I'm a big fan of Michelle because she's into the audio business, okay, and she offers a ton and ton of content and services uh, to the audio community. And that's how I came to know about the Ambies, the Podcast Academy, a lot of interesting things, you know, which Michelle does. Now, before we start this show, as you all know that tomorrow is Thanksgiving, so I want to wish each and every participant here listening to my show and even my even my guests a happy Thanksgiving in advance. Okay, I, I want to start off by saying thanks. Uh, it's been a year and I, I truly want to acknowledge my mom and my sister who has been a great inspiration in my life. We have gone through a lot of trouble as a family, a lot of hardship, but throughout this time, my mom has been very, very supportive. I look up to her and she is my role model. So I wanted to give thanks to her and I also wanted to acknowledge a few people in the podcast industry whom I look up to who has made uh, this whole thing happen. So far, I have done about 73 episodes back to back. I started in Jan of 2022. And I think I have done about 74 episodes so far. Okay, so I want to thank uh, LJ Haywood. I also want to thank Tiffany Werner. Tiffany Werner is also one of the individuals who introduced me to Michelle Cobb. And the last individual I want to thank is Girish Bali. He also, all of them, all of these guys are podcasters. Tiffany is also a part of, she also does the radio show, uh, which is also a part of what she does. So anyways, you know, let's actually deep dive into this conversation which we're going to have today. So today's conversation is about being the face of multiple companies. One good example is Tim Cook, uh, whom you see representing Apple. Uh, The guy from Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, who represents Facebook. These are the people, individuals who represent not only just one company, but multiple companies and and the other face of their business. So Michelle uh, suggested this topic and I think I I was very fascinated because it's a challenging role, first of all. And leaders must not only maintain emotional separation, they also need to do the work, but also maintain emotional separation between themselves and the companies they represent because uh, because at at some point, maybe certain decisions taken by the board can be uh, very challenging. And when you and and this can have an adverse effect when you are the actual face of the company. So Michelle would be deep diving into how to deal with those kind of things. Let's actually get to know who Michelle is. So Michelle is an entrepreneur. Okay, and she's a recognized expert in the audio publishing industry. Michelle uh, began her audio book career uh, as an assistant manager, direct assistant managing director for LA Theatre Works, became the vice president of sales and marketing for BBC uh, Audio Division and is the executive director of Audio Publisher Association after serving on the board for almost over a decade. Uh, As a consultant for PR sales, marketing and business development services, Michelle works with a long list of clients and is also the publisher for both Audiophile Magazine, MMB Media LLC. And Michelle has also expanded into the world of podcasts uh, over the past several years and is currently the executive producer of Stories of Impact Podcast. Uh, she is also the executive director of the Podcast Academy. I'm sure many of you guys may have heard about the Ambies and Ambies acknowledging a lot of podcasters. So she is the executive di- director of that. That's how I came to know about who she is and what she does. Uh, she's also a partner at Forte Business Consulting, uh, which we would be speaking towards the end of our show, what her services are and what kind of consulting services she offers as a business Uh, She offers business development, association management services for the publishing industry. So formally welcoming Michelle uh, to the virtual stage. Thank you so much, Michelle. Drum roll, drum roll, drum roll. Let's have some drum roll. Thank you. (laughs) Oh, wow. I feel like that's the end of the joke, though. (laughs) (laughs) So, so Michelle, thank you so much, you know, for the opportunity to interview you and uh, thanks for being on my show. 
let's start off uh, you know because i'm very fascinated with business and entrepreneurs you know who get into this game because you have to be really crazy to become an entrepreneur first of all so could you take us back through time and tell us how you got hooked on to the idea of being an entrepreneur not just one company but multiple and why do you love audio so much because i constantly see a lot of videos uh, which you participate and you broadcast on youtube most of them are about audio so i am just really fascinated i i like to get a little background so let's go ahead with that sure so i actually started way back when in my college days and uh my masters degree days of of studying theater and i was always on the directing side as opposed to the acting side and really involved in the business side so you know stage management and running the box office all of those other pieces of the business and for a couple of years after i graduated from my masters program i toured doing children's theater in a variety of places and directing kids and interacting with a wide variety of people and getting to travel it was kind of amazing but when you're traveling that much and this was way back when you know you had a cassette player in your car or truck and you had lots of hours to fill so i started listening to audiobooks and it was you know myself and my touring partner for a most of a year we listened to a number of audiobooks and we had those experiences together and after that i moved to los angeles um actually i lived in germany for a while and then i moved to los angeles and got involved with a company that records audio plays in front of a live audience which is la theater works and they didn't have anyone paying a lot of attention and time to the final product so they would record this play they would broadcast it on the radio and then they would sell it mostly to public libraries and they really didn't have an expert in that and i was like well i've i've listened to a lot of these i'm sitting in traffic in la so in 3 years in la i listened to about 300 plays and audiobooks and i thought let me find out more about the business itself and so i became involved as a volunteer with the audio publishers association and just really started to study the product which was kind of the culmination of my background of having gotten into performance and been on the side of the business side of performance so in a nutshell it was just sort of was like falling into my lap as the perfect thing for me to do and so i moved on to the BBC and became a volunteer with the Audio Publishers Association and just really began to immerse myself in the business and in the community. The Audio Publishers community is really one that is very supportive and lovely and it was just something that was sort of impossible to leave. Um so I did take a brief stint outside the audiobook world and the audio publishing world um in 2013 and i sold <laughs> actually sold printer labels and ink for a bit and uh went on to say oh i really miss audio and so i should maybe you know continue to explore that uh and what i decided was because everyone was calling me and saying what do you want your next job to be what are you interested in doing but a lot of people that were calling me were people whose jobs i had had the equivalent of and you don't want to say oh i want your job um but instead people said hey would you like to do this little project you know little consulting for us and what i realized after a few months was if i stopped trying to work a, a day job and started putting some time and attention into my networking and what i really was good at which was working in the audio world that i could probably start my own business and so i did and it was really really scary because i come from the new england background where you're supposed to grow up and you know have your health insurance and have your job to go to every day and you know be a company employee and what i found out was i stayed at some of these businesses for longer than maybe I would have because I was constantly changing job roles and trying new things and this was a great way to do that on a daily basis to work with different companies and to have different perspectives and to apply my knowledge in different places 
And I had worked with many, many consultants over the years. And what I found was that consultants were generally coming in, they would, you know, have some conversations, they would make some suggestions, and then they would leave. And I sort of wondered what would happen if a consultant comes in, gets to know the organization, and is working part time so that they're more affordable, um, but can have some long term stake in the organization and some long term presence. And so that's the way I've built my business is saying, hey, I'm going to come in, and this is not on every company, but I'm going to come in and you know evaluate, and then we can determine if I can help you do whatever we decide the company should do for a, you know a period of time. So that's where I am now. And that was very long-winded. Did I get everything? <laughs> no, no, it was definitely not long-winded. In fact, I like the fact that you broke it down to so many phases and uh, different things which you did. The thing which I really stood out, you know, stood out to me is about you experimenting different roles. Because when I was young, I also felt the same thing that you know it's too hard to come to a conclusion where your heart really lies at and it's better just to try different things different roles and see what you try you know what you enjoy doing the most and i think you were able to figure out that audio is where your heart lies and uh, kind of life kind of took you to that direction i also admire the fact that as a consultant uh, you were not doing the same thing as everybody else like consultants as you correctly said they offer you a solution and they are there for you know maybe a few months and they just walk away i don't think even months they offer you a solution and they walk out so so this perspective of you spending time uh, with the organization how did this arise like you know what made you spend more time because i don't think it's going to be a cheap affair right it's going to be expensive for the organization so how did you handle and what made you go to this direction well, hopefully, because I'm part time, I'm not more expensive, but I, I am something that, you know, someone that can come in and say, okay, I know how to do certain tasks, and I can do them pretty efficiently. So I can spend less time so the organization doesn't have to spend as much money. And also, because I travel within certain industries, I can often split the travel costs between multiple associations. So I might go to, say, the American Library Association conference and be able to charge each organization a little piece of the travel instead of the whole thing. Um, but yeah, it's just sort of, it sort of worked out over time for me was um, being able to say, okay, what does this organization need long-term? And it doesn't mean that I'm gonna be the, able to be the person to do it long term, but I can get you started. And if it works and we're comfortable together, then we can keep going for a period of time. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love the fact that, you know, you're approaching organizations with generosity. I mean, if you want, you could have split and uh, not split the invoice and charge them twice. <laughs> they would not have never known, but <laughs> I, I probably true, not the way I think, because I mostly work with nonprofits or not for profits or really small organizations, and because I I run my own really tiny audio publishing company, I do try to think, okay, how can we be efficient? Also, I'm a Virgo, so I love about I love everything about let's be efficient, let's you know not have to circle back on stuff. Um, you know, if we're if we're taking a trip, let's you know, go in the most direct route. Uh, and it's funny for me, having studied theater and direction and really finding out, okay, I'm pretty good at keeping things organized. And that has really helped me in my business long term. If I'm organized and I've got multiple clients and I can think linearly and I make a lot of lists, then I can be pretty good at getting stuff done. Oh, absolutely. I totally agree with you. Now, let's actually get into this conversation where, where people are actually patiently waiting for us. Now, yes. what I want to really understand is because you have a very unique role because you represent multiple organizations. So uh, now, could you tell us a bit about your role? And you not only represent brands, but you also work with brand ambassadors, Okay, which I found very interesting. Okay, now... What makes a person, Michelle, so valuable to a company that they decide to make them the face of an organization? So maybe you can tell us uh, a little perspective from from you know from your role, like what you feel, 
while working in these roles and maybe you can also clarify some difference between who is a brand ambassador and who is a brand spokesperson or influencer are they kind of all the same sure so many of the organizations that i work with have uh, elected and or appointed people to their boards so these are generally people from whatever industry that we're working with and they are usually very well recognized in that industry and their job is to set the strategic direction of the organization make sure that the work is getting done and also to represent that organization in some way and so in many ways they are influencers within the org within the industry and then they are essentially volunteer brand ambassadors and i represent the organization more from an administrative perspective i'm making sure that whatever the strategic vision the board has set is getting completed i'm representing you know the statistics and the things that we know about the industry and i'm also the face of what is happening with the membership because these are trade organizations so people belong to the organization and they're expecting things from the organization and so oftentimes i'm not necessarily the you know the front facing person it might be the president of the board or it might be the you know the chairperson of the board who's talking on behalf of the organization but when it comes to kind of a lot of the day-to-day -day operations i'm definitely the face which means that if something happens with the membership um, or something happens that the organization does that the membership doesn't like people equate me with that brand so that is a little bit different than maybe someone who is a paid influencer on social media or a brand ambassador that way or a celebrity talking about a brand it's kind of a funny role where i'm very much an administrator making sure that all these things happen but people think of me many times when they think of the organization so i have a lot of different perspectives to represent and think about Hmm, interesting. This is very interesting. So you operate as an uh, ambassador, but you also do administrative work. And the thing I, I what I research when I research about brand ambassadors, first of all, this is a referral marketing strategy. Okay. And I realized that an ambassador can be uh, an influencer, like, uh, like you said, or an industry expert, but they can also be an employee of the organization. Or anyone who is passionate about the brand and what they offer and what you what the company stands for, so it can be a super user, right? And it can be somebody yep. who is just in love with what the organization does, and it can be also be a volunteer too. So, go ahead. Yes, for for the trade associations, you know, the brand ambassadors really are those volunteer board members who are, you know, giving of their time and their energy to make sure that the organization is moving forward. And in the case of, say, the Audio Publishers Association, a lot of what we are thinking about and doing is consumer facing. So how do we interest the, you know, all the people out there who have never listened to an audiobook into trying one? What can we do as an organization that doesn't publish any titles? How can we work together to be putting the word out about audiobooks in general and then how can the board members you know support those efforts awesome awesome i love that i i love this answer thank you so much for sharing it let's actually go a little further because i want to actually give people an idea about referral marketing how it helps by the way uh referral marketing is like a word of mouth uh you know marketing technique uh, it's also it, you know, the, I think the objective behind people or organization, not people, but organization to look at referral marketing as a strategy, because the customer acquisition cost is always on the higher side, you know, especially when your business is new and we want to get it down. And second, we want to ensure that we attract the right people and we want to ensure that, you know, they initiate or make some purchases. So we want people uh, you know, we, we want this to happen, but at the same time, we want to keep costs down and people uh, end up buying from other people whom they 
see a representation of themselves you know they it can be a celebrity it can be you know just an average joe it can be me it can be anyone okay somebody where they can see a reflection of themselves and they end up you know having a higher level of trust to engage with this brand do you think uh, based on your professional experience uh, michelle you know is that how referral marketing works or do you have another opinion on it yes and in fact you know the organizations i work with will often work with another type of company who will set up some of this brand ambassador marketing. So we might, for instance, hire last year, the Audio Publishers Association um, hired a company named Branch and Bramble, and they worked with TikTok influencers to get people to talk about audiobooks and to experience audiobooks. And that was really very much, you know, the, the way that the organization can do it because we're talking about a format. And so members put forth some ideas on titles and those ideas were picked by the various TikTok influencers and talked about. And so the way we have to do it as a trade association is a little bit different as a single business, um, but we can participate in that way. And indeed we did, and it was kind of fun to watch what these you know, influencers put out uh, about audiobooks and about these particular titles. Awesome, awesome. Now I want to actually, you know, deep dive into something which you highlighted before uh, pre-interview conversation. You said something about volunteer non-profit board role as a brand ambassador. Okay, now this was something very new to me. So could you help my listeners understand what exactly is a volunteer non-profit board role of a brand ambassador? Yeah, and that's really, you know, those board members who are uh, elected or appointed to the board, they are representing the organization. And in the case of a trade association, that is usually around a particular industry. So it might be books or audiobooks or podcasts. And their role is to, you know, use their platform and influence to talk about that association. And usually, the products that that association is representing. And they're doing that through their social, they're doing that through their networking, and they're doing that through their, their time. And what's so exciting when you're working with multiple of these nonprofit boards is you're meeting a really interesting wide variety of people who have different perspectives and come from different places in the industry. And you're kind of bringing that all together and then watching how each of them influences in a different way. Some people are a little bit more behind the scenes. Some people are very much about posting on social, but they're all very good at bringing their own experience and their own network to the organization in some way, which is very important. Awesome. awesome. So, so from what I understand is that so many organizations are just pivoting from, from what I'm understanding, from what you're saying, are pivoting from... Uh, you know, just having one person as a face of a company where they have multiple individuals who can be a face of an organization. Okay, some of them would have higher influence, some of them would have lower influence. So it sounds more like an employee advocacy uh, strategy. Would you agree? It's, it's actually, it's kind of its own thing because none of these people work for the organization. They're all volunteering their time and they're volunteering their time to talk about an industry and this particular organization focuses on an industry so like in the united states the, the campaign that people always think about is the got milk campaign where all of the uh, milk farmers got together and hired uh you know a, a marketing company and for years we we saw all these commercials about got milk and that was very effective i think um and this you know th this is even more different because a lot of what they're doing in today's world, which has so much social media and has so much digital marketing, is just putting the word out there about the format and the things that the organization are doing, oftentimes things like awards, to um, entice listeners, in this case, to to the different formats. Awesome. Does that awesome. make sense? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Partially, I mean, I'm understanding it. I'm learning as we are progressing. 
I, I wanted to actually share with individuals some statistics on what I found out about employee advocacy as a strategy in many organizations are applying. Now, the example which you said, you're representing, you're actually stating it more of an organization is slightly different. Okay, traditional companies, Michelle, if traditional company had to do advocacy and ambassador marketing, how what would that look like? So that would look, you know, that could look like hiring one person to be the the spokesperson for um, that campaign or that industry. Um, or it could be, you know, sending out all of your employees to kind of talk about, you know, the brand and whatever the product is kind of together. So there's different ways of, of handling it. Okay. A lot of it is a lot of it is paid influence, though. Yeah, you know, yeah, especially absolutely. in today's today's world, you're hiring <laughs> someone who has a uh, who has a, a you know a footprint to talk about your product. Yeah, yeah. Upon research, you know, I realized there are a lot of uh, you know companies who are actually pivoting when they want employees to be brand ambassadors. too. they let employees market about their brand? Examples of such companies are Starbucks, Walmart, Macy's, uh, even Electronic Arts. Now. Uh, you know, I, I was reading about employee advocacy and I was trying to go through some surveys. And uh, according to Edelman Trust Barometer Survey, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. The customer perceives staff in any organization to be more trustworthy than the corporate marketing. Uh, additional 77% of consumers are likely to purchase after hearing uh, about it from someone they trust. And employees can be a good way to build that trust, you know, because your parents, your families, stuff like that, you know, people whom you're connected to. Entrepreneur Magazine states that social media content shared by employees get eight times more engagement than content shared by the brand and social channels and is shared 25 times more frequently. Uh, Fast Company Magazine uh, said that uh, any lead developed through employees, social marketing converts seven times more frequently than other leads. Uh, Nielsen Audience Survey research proved 84% of people trust a recommendation from people whom they know and any other form than any other form of advertising. And even on LinkedIn, according to LinkedIn research, companies whose employees share their brand social content see a lift in views of job posting reviews, uh, feedback sharing reviews, stuff like that. So I, I see a lot of reward, Michelle. I feel, I mean, this is just my personal thought. I feel a lot of reward wherein you not only have ambassadors, spokesperson or influencers as a part of your organization representing your brand, but your employees can also help you to scale and, you know, may grow, help you grow faster. Uh, would you like to share your thoughts on what you just heard? Yeah. And I, again, that's a lot of what the board does is, you know, let's take the example of the podcast Academy. So we have an awards called the Ambies uh, for excellence in podcasting. And we just actually closed our submission period. And every day for a week, I would send whatever the social post on the Ambies was to all the board members out and they would repost it. And their reach much, much further than, you know, an organization that's less than three years old, you know. So I do think, um, you know, in some ways, board members are are both brand ambassadors and employee advocates, which is interesting. It is. It is, actually. But this is actually a lot of work. So... You know, let's let's actually deep dive into the challenging side of things. So because being a face of a company is such a challenging role because you're stressed out, a lot of components to think of, especially while you're executing things, and it can really emotionally affect you. Okay, and that was what the title of this conversation was today. So how can leaders such as yourself can and can maintain that emotional separation between them, what they do and the companies they represent? Well, this is something I think that people are constantly working on, and some people are better at it than others, right? Uh, so you, each person has to individually find their personal techniques for dealing with stress and also just not carrying the emotional burden. So for me, I find it's often hard for me to separate from what's happening with the organization and my personal life because I feel personally responsible for whatever is 
going on. And usually it's something that hasn't quite gone the, you know, the way I would like it to go. Um, but I have to find a way to say, okay, I can't stop living. I can't stop enjoying my life because something didn't go perfectly. And so I use a lot of techniques of, you know, exercising going out for a walk, ironically listening to an audiobook or a podcast as I do it, which is technically working, um, just to sort of get out of the headspace and the the emotional loop of being stuck in, you know, what did I do? What could I have done better? Um, what are people saying? You know, there's lots of examples of things that happen, especially in an industry that get linked back to an association that um, represents the industry, even if they're not totally related. And what I have found uh, is difficult for me is just to say, okay, what's happening with the organization is not about me. And that's why I really have to make an effort to do a lot of self-care things like the exercise, like getting the occasional massage and also just putting everything down and saying, all right, it's the weekend, something has exploded, I've done what I can do, I'm going to put the phone down, and I'm going to go and watch, you know, an episode of Friends or whatever it is, um, and just stop thinking about it. And that's been a real challenge for me to find ways to stop thinking about it, and find ways to stop evaluating it. Because it's already happened, what has happened has happened, I can't change the past. And spending a lot of time focusing on you know, what could I have done better in this situation isn't going to, you know, move us forward. <laughs> so Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. I have a few more questions and we will, we're going to start Q&A. So whoever is listening to us on LinkedIn and Clubhouse, I want to welcome you all to come up. Uh, you know, you just have to raise your hand. I would be happy to bring you on to this virtual stage and you, you're welcome to ask any sort of questions to Michelle uh, and clarify uh, things. You know, if you have, if you are in a similar situation, maybe she can throw you some guidance as to what you can do. So my question uh, to you, Michelle, is as a, you know, as a follow up of what we just shared, what you just shared uh, is that. It, it is sometimes really challenging uh, because your reputation is also on the line, right? And what if, if, and maybe you can share an example of something, you know, an example of a decision which was taken by the board, which probably you may not agree, okay, but you still had to enforce it, you still had to do it. So that, you know, really stresses an individual out. And maybe that's not the right direction they are heading. So, what would you do in such a case, you know, do, would, you, would you end up, you know, trying to correct them or would you go with the flow or how would you take feedback from those, uh, you know, people whom you are communicating this message to? I'm really, you know, I, I think it's really hard. I have no idea how you are doing it. So I want to get your point on it, point of view. Yeah. And I think, you know, I don't have a lot of examples where I didn't necessarily, dis you know, where I disagreed with the board. I think part of my job is to try and understand a variety of perspectives and to um, represent, you know, the one that the board has uh, chosen, even if I'm not 100% aligned with that. I'm, I'm usually pretty much on board with it. There you go. Haha. -ha. There's you. Now we need our drum roll board on board with it. Um, so... <laughs> You know, I, I think the, I'll give an example for the Audio Publishers Association. There have been technology companies that are, have been members of the association for years. And it, you know, about a year ago, there was some discovery that these organizations had been part of, of the association. And people, uh, not all the members felt good about that, but according to our bylaws, those companies were allowed to join and be members. And, you know, the, the board position was, you know, we want to make sure that our circle of community is fully open and we don't, you know, overlook the, the business practices of various members. So, you know, it was a little bit, people were not necessarily thrilled with that answer. And the hard part for me was not that um, the board was making a determination, which was they had made because of the bylaws and because, you know, it had come up in discussion, 
years before. What what types of companies can belong? Well, according to our bylaws, anyone can. So are we good with that? Yes. Um, the hard part for me was that people were having a, a personal response to me as if this was one person, one board member, one executive director who had made this decision and that we could throw all of the negative emotions towards that one person. And so that was very difficult. And it, it took a lot for me just to step back and say, okay, I realized that what people are doing is being upset. And they're not actually upset about uh, upset at me as a person, but they need somewhere to direct that. And so I'm the person that's being directed to, and I just have to not take on that negative energy. And that was really hard. It probably took me six weeks of really being a bit sad and depressed about it um, before I could step away and say, okay, I realize that that's their emotional reaction, which they're allowed to have, and it's not really about me. And so I shouldn't um, take on the, the negative side of things. So it was a long process, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it is a long process. Six months. Wow. That's, 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 that can be exhausting and tiring. So, Michelle, you know, I appreciate you sharing that. I want to ask you, you know, because usually, guys, you know, before a guest joins a live interview, I send them an intake form. So on the intake form, I asked Michelle, you know, who can, who is your biggest influence in life? And you said a collection of people plus your husband. So why don't you give the audience a bit more, try to understand who are these collection of people and, and why your husband is such a big influence? Not that I hate it. You know, it's a good thing. I'm just asking. <laughs> sure. Well, I'll start with my husband because um, he is a very calm person. So it's, it takes a lot to get him riled up. And I grew up in a family that was, you know, has some Italian roots and was from New England, very loud and lots of, you know, brisk discussion and, you know, shouting above each other. Even if it wasn't in anger, it was just like, whoever's speaking the loudest is being heard. Um, and so he comes from, you know, very calm background where everyone's speaks quietly and you know when they get together they everyone might be reading a different book in the same room and he really sort of helped me to not climb the emotional ladder especially when it came to work if I would be working with maybe 10 people and someone would get very upset and I would try to solve the problem and I would like try to meet their emotional space and go with them and figure out what was wrong and let's all, you know, get this fixed. But I would get very emotionally hyped up. And I think through observing him, I started to see, okay, well, what happens if you just go solve the problem without getting emotionally hyped up? Maybe that would be better. And indeed it was. So we've developed you know, not like I grew up with at all, but this kind of calm household. We have one daughter. Everything's pretty calm. People talk about how calm our household is. And I don't necessarily feel that way inside my head all the time, but I have been able to enjoy the kind of calmness that uh, was very disparate to what I was used to as a small person. <laughs> <laughs> that actually, you know, points me to my next question, because uh, when I ask you to share some resources, quotes, books and blogs, you know, which you really admire and you you highlighted this quote, keep calm and carry on. I think that's also uh, pointing out it's coming from your influence, you know, how your husband influenced your life. Right. Keep calm and carry on. Or do you have a different take on this? No, totally. And it's not just, you know, not just Christopher has this keep calm and carry on uh, type of background. But, you know, there, there are people that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis that I wouldn't say I'm necessarily an optimist. Um, but I like working with people that have a very different perspectives than I do. And uh, that's one of the things like if you are working with, if you're not an optimist, you're working with an optimist who's always like, oh, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Uh, eventually you get to the point of it's like, okay, yeah, 
this isn't brain surgery. No one's going to die on an operating table if we are figuring things out or, or um, you know, changing or being flexible as we go along. So yeah, let's keep calm and let's just keep going and pretty much assume it's all going to work out. And everyone's working towards that goal of making sure everything works out. So I, I do kind of return to that, that quote. And I'm not always successful at keeping calm internally, mostly. <laughs> um, but uh <laughs> Hopefully I'm surrounding myself with enough people who, um, you know, have that chill vibe uh, that we are successful in keeping calm as a group. Awesome. Awesome. I appreciate that. Shail. I have one last question before we start Q&A. So, you know, guys, once again, if you've been listening to the show for the past 20 minutes, feel free to come up and contribute. Uh, just remember this conversation is being recorded. So uh, whatever you would be sharing would be uploaded as a part of the podcast so while coming up you're verbally giving us consent to proceed with the recording so anyways michelle so my last question for you uh, is that a lot of people like to leave some legacy and they want something to be remembered for what is that one thing you want to be remembered for you know it's funny because it, I, i'm not sure this is what i want to be remembered for but i think this is what i will be remembered for is basically keeping everyone organized and, you know, herding a lot of cats. So I have a lot of different boards that I work with and a lot of people texting me with the same question, where's the link for today's meeting? You know, where do we find this document? And so hopefully I'll be remembered for keeping everyone on track. <laughs> Well, that's that's super cool uh, because I, I think, you know, you are a very integral part of the organization and what you're doing. And without you, I think a lot of, a lot of magic wouldn't have really happened, right? Uh, a great advice, you know, one of my managers when I used to work with in an automotive company, this manager also said the same thing, you know, become an integral part of your organization, uh, so that you know you without you a lot of things won't work i don't know if it's selfish but whatever you know but i think it was a good advice. i don't i don't know that if, if things wouldn't work if i wasn't there but uh i think that you know it wouldn't be that having organized some, maybe <laughs> maybe maybe not maybe not i think you know of course as with anything everyone is is replaceable in a job but hopefully um people will uh you know Keep those, keep all the ships running on time, whoever is in charge, really. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I want to actually, uh, you know, sh give a shout out to Natasha, uh, who is a very close friend uh, from the Marketing Cafe in, on Clubhouse. And uh, she's been actually listening to my show right from the very beginning, wherein I was stammering. Okay, there was a lot of uh, pauses, hiccups. I don't know what the hell I was doing, but yeah. So thank you, Natasha, for your love and support. Uh, I want to also give a shout out to Lauren, Alma, once again. I also want to actually acknowledge some of the people who are actually listening to us on LinkedIn. Donna, Flo, again. Uh, Brandon, K Katie, Santosh, Michael, Arthur, Claudia, Jacqueline, B Belinda, Victor, and Paul. And thank you so much, guys, for your love and support. I really appreciate it. Please do not hesitate to come up if you like. I want to say uh, thanks to Thomas, you know, who is from Australia and he actually listens to my show at 4 a.m. A-E-D-T or A-E-S-T. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> so Thomas, welcome. And please unmute yourself. Do you, do you have a question for Michelle or would you like to contribute to this conversation? Good morning, Jason. And uh, hello, Michelle. Uh, nice to meet you. And uh, thank you for, uh, for handing me the microphone. Um, Jason's, Dead right. It's four forty-five a.m. Um, but I'm not crazy. I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just an interested person that listens to a few podcasts around the world. And um, Jason and I have known each other for around about two months, possibly. Um, I love his content. I love his topics. I think he he brings out some really interesting. Um, guest speakers and Michelle, uh, nice to meet you. I, I've been listening for the last 40 minutes and I have a couple of notes because obviously I'm a little bit more tired than you. But firstly, <laughs> I want to, firstly, I wanted to say you are obviously a typical Virgo like me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I was, 
30th of August, 1963. So, um, I love herding a lot of cats. I love keeping people organized. So I think we are kind of similar in that, in that respect, but I'm a male and you're a female, but maybe I'm a little bit more like your husband, Chris. Um, I I value, uh, you know, emotional intelligence. Um, I'm married to a, to a, a beautiful woman for the last 19 years who is quite fiery. She's not, she doesn't have Italian roots like yourself, but she, um, she has strong Irish roots and, um, we, uh, yeah, there's lots of fireworks in our house. So I've decided at the age of 59 that I have to try to be, um, more like your husband, Chris. Anyway, enough of the rabbiting on. I had a couple of comments. Firstly, I wanted to say, uh, I think it's great that someone from, from a New England background, you know, conservative college background, uh, you know, has gone out and, and done what you love doing because that's kind of what I'm wanting to do and I'm gravitating to that. As I said, I'm, I'm 59 and I don't want to retire just yet, but um, I think I think no one ever retires. They they gravitate to what they love doing. But I love the concept of, of you working with multiple companies. I think the issue with, with um, consultants now is that, and I've worked in a lot of corporations, large corporations in Australia, but a lot of the consultants come in, they get paid a lot of money. They spend, you know, two, three, four, five, six weeks, maybe three months with with a company. They, they you know, produce a lot of good PowerPoints and reports and presentations and then, and then they go. And I think I like your concept where you, you put a little bit of your magic dust into the company or the um, not-for-profit um, or association but stay there perhaps a bit longer and therefore you've got a bit more of that maybe that virgo control where you you can stay and and perhaps monitor a bit more so i like that um and yeah i just uh, just wrote one other thing um i love keeping calm and carrying on so obviously uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, stuff going on in, for me in australia but um I'm keeping calm and I'm carrying on and listening to Jason helps me, um, helps me keep calm. So if I can't sleep, I dial in and he gives me a reminder and, um, that's why I'm here. So nice to meet you and, um, happy to, uh, get any of your, um, feedback on, on anything that I've said, Michelle. Well, it's clear that we share a lot because I'm an early riser myself. It, I'm not, it's not unknown for me to get up between four and five in the morning, which is fun. Um, and one of the things that I would say is you're looking at maybe what your next career is. I feel like I, as someone who was never going to be an entrepreneur and never going to get away from working a company, working for a company, uh, has become very much an entrepreneur pusher where I encourage people as you're looking at what your next job is or what your next career is to go ahead and try to work with different organizations or to be an entrepreneur and have a little bit more control of how you live your life because that can really be a positive thing. So a lot of people have come to me and said, what was it like when you you know, switched to running your own business? Like, was that really a struggle? And I've been like, yes, it's a struggle, but the rewards are quite high. So you should try it. And I try to connect people, you know, if they need accounting help or, um, you know, set them, give them some guides for uh, things that they should have prepared when they start their own business. So I encourage you to, to figure out what your next career is and don't be afraid to let that next career be an entrepreneurial one. Thank you. Appreciate it. Awesome. Good luck. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. While Thomas was actually asking this question, Michelle, I was just wondering, okay, now as a designer, I can also be like a consultant. Like I execute things, but, uh, you know, I am also a consultant um, when, when I do strategy and stuff like that. So 
at some point uh, the client can actually lose some interest and i won't be very very desirable or is as interesting as i when i started because people get habituated uh, you know when they see something new okay they like it but after after a while you know it just doesn't appear to have the same finesse as you originally started so in your case michel i'm just asking this is just for my knowledge how do you uh, still you know try to be cool and <laughs> calm and interesting <laughs> like how how and fresh fresh <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i think that's for, for me one of those positive things about working with different organizations is that i can be exposed to new things new ways of working new um people who can cause me to say oh look at the way we're doing it at this organization and that might work really well for a different organization so one of the things like when the pandemic happened some of the organizations that i work with on a daily basis were not equipped to be remote yet i had businesses that i worked with that had been fully remote for a long time so i was able to say okay here are the tools that we would need to get fully remote and here's how you know here's the steps that we can take and let's try and every organization some of them took a little longer than others uh, was able to pivot to being fully remote and that was something i had because i worked with all these different places and was learning from all of these different places um, so i was able to be really calm and say not only do i know that we can do this but here are the tools we need to do it Mm -hmm. makes sense makes sense thank you so much for sharing that michelle so uh, thomas do you have a follow-up question before we move ahead oh uh, no I'm, i'm good thanks jason thanks all for right sure. all right so let's actually get into uh the next round <laughs> so this is actually for the rapid fire questions okay very interesting and michelle feel free to have a sip of water i know sometimes these interviews can be lengthy okay so i have one common question which we would ask thomas and whoever else decides to join the stage at this moment i don't have anybody else except for thomas so so my first question to you what's uh what's a crazy adventure you want to try in life and you can't take too much time to think okay it has to be quick Oh, it would, it's very easy. I would travel around the world. Like there are those, you can buy like a plane ticket that goes around the whole world. I would love to do that. Okay, which of country course. Which country would you start with? Like the first country? Oh, I mean, I'd start here in the US and then I'd go to, I don't know which country I'd go to next, but I know that I would definitely hit Thailand, India, Japan, Australia, um, probably right i'd be interested in going to the ukraine as well right now so um yeah and plus A africa i've never been to africa as a continent so something in africa it'd be great <laughs> that's super cool that's super cool maybe you can do it one at a time you know rather than doing the whole thing because i don't think <laughs> being the face of so many companies they're going to let you go <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true but like you know this sometime in my life you know i could have a crazy adventure maybe i've <laughs> retired from these things but uh i'm traveling around the world all right all right i i appreciate that thank you so much okay now do you have a ch uh, do you have an imaginary childhood friend i didn't have an imaginary friend as a child <laughs> nope <laughs> <laughs> okay okay next question okay now What are some of your clients or colleagues nicknames? Okay, and it could be board members also, you know, it's funny names, interesting names you have given them. I I can't think. We don't really use nicknames. I mean, if the only nickname that I really use on a regular basis is when I apply to myself, is when I say to someone, I'm sorry I'm being a PETA or a PITA, which is pain in the ass, and I need to get this answer. <laughs> so sometimes I refer to myself as a PETA, but that's about it. Okay, okay. Now, do you think aliens exist? I think they do, yeah, probably. Okay, did you ever watch any episode of Ancient Aliens from the History Channel? No, but my husband loves all of those shows, so <laughs> I hear about them. Okay, now if you ever were to meet an alien face to face, what would be the first question you're going to ask them? Oh, what what's their planet like? <laughs> I don't you know. 
And what do they eat? Because I'm constantly interested in food. <laughs> <laughs> lovely, lovely. Okay, so, okay, let me see. What do you think would be your last meal if you were on death row? Oh, it would be sushi from Kabasu in, uh, I guess it's Silver Lake, uh, California. <laughs> mm, sushi. Very yes. interesting. Thank you. Okay, now one common question for everyone, including you, Thomas. Okay, now we'll, we'll start with you, Michelle. Okay, what would you do if you can live forever? Uh, uh, live forever? Okay, let's let's keep the traveling thing aside. So apart from traveling, because I know it's one of the adventures you want to do, but apart from that, and if you want to do something forever, what would that be? Well, first of all, I sincerely hope I do not live forever. Um, but if I was living forever, I would like to cure a major disease. That's that's super cool, Michelle. That's super cool. What which a disease would you like to cure? I mean, cancer comes to mind. You know, if you live long enough, currently you pretty much end up with cancer. So if there was a way to cure that, that might be that might help a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. Let's actually start uh, with Thomas. Thomas, okay, how would you answer the same question if I were to ask you? Um, if well, you, I'd answer it two ways. Yeah, if you could I, live forever. I'd answer, yeah, if I could live forever. My first answer was going to be that I would explain and educate to people in the future that life existed before iPhones and the internet. Ooh, um, good one. Good one. And, and I think when I, was, when I was a kid growing up, you know, it was pretty innocent. And, you know, in the summer we went down the pool, we rode our bikes, and we said to our mom and dad, um, you know, make sure you're home before the sun comes down and stuff like that. But we didn't stress out that Snapchat or TikTok wasn't working and all that. So if I live forever, you know, in 200 years time, I'd still be alive and no one would know about how the people that, that lived, you know, in the seventies and eighties and nineties, but this, what Michelle said with reference to cancer, uh, Alzheimer's because because my mom died of Alzheimer's um, early this year. I'm so sorry to hear that, Thomas. That's okay. My condolences to you and and uh, is there anything you like to share? Anything more before we acknowledge another person whom we have on stage? No, no. I, th I just I just think um, I'm I'm passionate about you know, communications. And I think um, too many people, especially young kids, like um, spend a lot of passion. And I think uh, people can learn about the future by looking at the past. And um, I know, I know uh, technology is, is, is brilliant. And if it wasn't for technology, I wouldn't have met you, Jason, or or Michelle, or anyone around the other side of the world, but I think sometimes we take a step back and and live our life in the present moment and just enjoy, you know, smelling the roses and and not not the digital roses. So that's all I'll say. I I acknowledge that completely. I agree with you one hundred percent. Always pros and cons to things. See how you can you know make it work, guys. I want to acknowledge uh, Larni. Uh, welcome to uh, to the brand identity design podcast is it do you have a question for michelle or would you like to contribute to this conversation hi how are you i'm doing phenomenal thank you so much for asking i hope you're well too oh, i'm getting better i had laryngitis oh sorry to hear that i hope you uh, recover soon i have no idea what that is to be very very oh, honest the inflammation of the vocal cords Okay, okay. I, is that something which is recoverable? Yes, yes. Okay, I wish you a speedy recovery then, Larni. Thank you so much. You're yeah, welcome. thank you for chatting to me. Yeah, um, go ahead. Just in regards to the, the, the question, if I lived longer, I would just continue to help others. Oh, nice. 
Nice. Okay, what would you do if you could live forever then you would continue helping people? Okay, um, is there anything in specific or anything in particular you would have done? Pretty much just continue to empower people to speak up and just to live a happy life. That is super cool of you. I'm going to have I'm going to mm-hmm. play a drum roll sound effect just for that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay that's the longest drum roll I could find online. <laughs> that is so cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. So so Michelle you know since we don't have any uh, any more speakers on stage you know let's actually you know get into the business side of things. So uh, you do have a company called Forte Business Consulting. So guys if you're interested in checking out Michelle's website is forte bc dot com bc for business consulting f o r t e b c dot com you should be able to find it on the description or on the comments uh, for this event uh, if you are on LinkedIn so so go ahead Michelle you know so can you tell a bit about what's your company's vision is as a consultant and where do you want to reach in the future sure we're all, we're all- Well, our main focus is helping small and medium-sized companies, you know, with whatever they need. And oftentimes, as I said before, that's going in and uh, evaluating, hey, this is how something could be achieved. And then if it makes sense for us to uh, stay and help you achieve uh, your goals. Um, sometimes we just come in and do a, a research project or any of that. But our goal is really just to be uh, as helpful as we can in the appropriate amount of time for your company and to kind of solve whatever problem it is that, that you need solved. That is lovely. Who actually gave this name Forte? Because I know Forte means excellence. So was it you, your husband? How did you come up with this name? I think my business partner and I came up with it. Um, <laughs> I don't really remember how. Uh, we were publishing, we, you know, we own a very small audio publishing company together and he was, he's a finance guy and he was working uh, in the jewelry business and he said, oh, I'm thinking of becoming a consultant. And I was like, oh, do you want to do it together? Because I could really use some help in the areas that you have strength in. Uh, and so, yeah. uh we formed this in uh, 2016 so it's uh, coming up right on uh, our anniversary in december oh congratulations on that michelle congratulations on that i wow that's quite a long time 2016 till now wow you guys been kicking it thank you so do you do you have any upcoming events promotions speaking engagements anything you like to promote on 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 my show Well, I will promote for the organizations that I work with. Absolutely, um, please the, go ahead. You know, the Podcast Academy, uh we do the Ambies. That submission period is closed, but we will be um having the Ambies live and in person on March 7th of 2023 in Las Vegas, uh within the the same timeline as Podcast Movement Evolutions. So we are Tuesday night. And if you're coming to Podcast Movement Evolutions, you know, look out for for us. And if you're not coming, uh we will be broadcasting online somewhere, so look for that on March 7th. And then the Audio Publishers Association, we are also in the midst of our awards. So we have the Audi Awards, and that will be um uh, March 27th. in New York live and in person again so i'm not sure what our uh, if we're going to stream that but um look for all of those you know great suggestions for podcasts who win awards and audiobooks who win awards coming in march of 2023 oh that is phenomenal michelle i appreciate you sharing it now before we wrap up today's show if people want to reach out to you the website uh, which i highlighted is that the best way to reach out to you or uh is there another website email address anything you like to share sure yes fortebc.com is the best way to reach me and my email address is michelle with one l so that's m i c h e l e at fortebc.com awesome awesome now before we wrap up you know i just wanted to ask you since tomorrow is thanksgiving michelle thomas and larney would you like to say thanks to anyone 
Well, I would of course like to say thank you to you for having me on, um, but I would also like to say thank you to all the people that I work with at the variety of organizations. Uh, I learn a lot from each of them every single day and you know, working with different personality types and different ways of working is really great for keeping um, me on my toes and keeping my brain facile. So I really say thank you to all of them not just people who are being paid, but volunteers for, um, you know, making my life more interesting and helping me uh, be the best that I can be. Absolutely. I love this so much, Michelle. And I'm just going to ask the same question to Thomas. So Thomas, uh, what about you? Um, I look, I obviously in, in Australia, we don't celebrate Thanksgiving, um, but I've listened to a few kind of podcasts over the last few days and week and I, I understand that it's a, it's a huge kind of thing in, in America and you know I definitely respect that but I guess for me personally um, look I, I'd like to say uh, thank you to you Jason for uh, giving me the opportunity to um, to be able to, to speak on your stage and to uh, for you to open my mind to brand um, identity. I've, I've, I've certainly knew nothing about brand, um, you know, before, before I met you and, uh, just listening to you and all your speakers over the last couple of months. Um, yeah. Th thank you to yourself, um, for, uh, opening up my world, uh, so to speak. <laughs> well, you're welcome, Thomas. And, and thank you so much, Michelle, uh, for those kind words as well. I shouldn't, I, I didn't acknowledge it, but thank you. Uh, for being here and Thomas thank you so much for those kind words about me and my show uh, you're a regular contributor and I, I think the show is incomplete without you so thank you for regularly joining and even I see Karen down in the audience she's also a regular uh, participant uh, of my show so thank you Karen shout out to you if you if you like to come up feel free so Larni so how about you you know and you would be the last so go ahead you know if you want to say thanks to anybody who would that be <coughs> Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thanks for letting me know that it's Thanksgiving tomorrow because <laughs> I'm in Australia as well. Uh, we do have some friends that celebrate that from America. Um, yeah, thank you, I guess, to my supportive immediate family who have been there through the tough times. Um, I thank the trauma, like the bad opportunities that I've had that's helped me to grow and be the person that I am. And yeah, thank you for even asking me and being caring enough to want to know what, what about me, I guess. Oh, absolutely. You know, thank you so much for being here and we appreciate your contribution. Uh, on that note, I, I want to actually quickly give people a heads up on uh, the next week's show, season three, episode 12. Uh, the name of the show, the title we have come up with is Be Less Vanilla. Okay, it's about not being average, don't be a vanilla, try to be flavorful. Okay, so be embracing who you are as an individual, you know, be full of flavors, embrace your uniqueness, strength, weakness, even limitation, how you look, appear, sound, smell, just embrace it and be daring enough to stand amidst of the crowd, speaking your mind out with confidence and telling the whole world who you are and what your dreams are. So uh, it's November 30th at 12 p.m. EST. Uh, please listen to that conversation. Uh, you should be able to find this on my profile or if you're following the event page itself, I should be able to post it shortly. Okay, on, on that note, Michelle, do you have any final thoughts, anything you'd like to share before we wrap the show up? I would just in encourage everyone to, you know, believe in themselves. If you want to go out on your own, it's totally possible. And it seems completely scary. I can say that from experience, but it can be really rewarding. So don't be afraid. Absolutely. 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 So thank you so much, guys. Uh, you take care of yourself and, and have a lovely morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. I'll, I'll get in touch with you. I'll see you guys. I should not touch. I'll see you guys next week. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks, Larni and Thomas, too. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. Thank you. Goodbye.